Well, I hope uh, everybody got here in time for some breakfast. It was awesome. Um, I think Pam, Leah, Phil, Gary, even Gary was trying to contribute. I don't know, you know, what happened to him. Brad was going to do it, but he got kicked out of the kitchen by the women. Yeah, he surrendered. He was saying, I surrender all. I'll leave the kitchen now. <laughs> There was something in one of the songs that we just sang that I thought was profoundly important for the Christian walk, is where do you see your sin? Because, you know, you go through life and the enemy is so keen in reminding you of your sin. And it can be something that happened 20 years ago, 30 years ago, or last week. It doesn't matter. And he brings it up into your face and you're like, oh, and you start to carry the weight of it. But remember that what we're saying just comes is exactly what Hebrews is teaching us, that you don't bear your sin anymore, Amen. that you're completely forgiven, that, that the assurance that you're going to heaven when you die, I, there, there's been a TV commercial coming on lately. It says, do you know if you'll, when you die, if you'll go to heaven. I don't know who's sponsoring it, but it's, it comes on periodically, and I go, do I know? I'm already there. I don't have to worry about it, because in Christ, when you're united to Christ, you're where he was. And when he went to the cross, he took all of your sin. So see your sin there. Don't put it on yourself. Don't let it weigh you down, no matter what the enemy says to you. Listen to hear the voice of God that says, and I paid it all in full. Uh, as a reminder, this Friday we'll have a Good Friday service. Uh, we like to do it every year, 6 o'clock. Usually we're done by 7 or earlier because I limit my preaching time. It's like the one time a year that I limit it. We're all in agreement. Yeah, um, it's not that I don't want to preach longer. It's just that I want it to be all about Jesus. Now, right. you won't you won't believe this, but sometimes people complain that I preach too long, <laughs> and I'm like, before you complain, ask Jesus if He's upset about it. <laughs> no, He wasn't. I talk to him because just because you're not, you're like, we need to be done at 1130. No, we're done at 12. Usually the real Christians stay. <laughs> you know, the people that really love Jesus, they stay to go deeper. I'm looking right at you, Brad. Yeah, um, there's no guilt and shame, no condemnation. And those who aren't are in big trouble. <laughs> Anyways, I'm, we'll have a Good Friday at 6, and then Sunday we'll have a regular schedule for Easter. And um, I've already been working on my Good Friday message. I'm just trying to figure out how to do it in 30 minutes. Isaiah 53. Um, and then my Easter message is going to be very brief. Amen. Just cover the whole book of Josea. <laughs> Anyways, um, like all these holidays that we have, we tend to secularize them. And let's remember that it is really about him. Especially Good Friday is so important to, to remember and affirm, you know what, I'm, I don't bear my sin any longer. You know, and that's such good news. So the writer of Hebrews, he's moving. We're in chapter 6 in verse 12 through 15. We're going to cover today. He's moving between the comparison of the true disciples of Jesus and those Jewish people who had heard and seen and tasted but not believed. They were holding on to 
an American culture with, without giving their lives to the Savior. So he says, it's, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be talking about wheats and tares anymore because they look similar when they're growing up, but they have a different harvest. So he's now moving us to what is true faith? So as you and I live as beloved, we can't help but allow his love to flow through us. The, the reason we emphasize God's love for us is because you can't love your neighbor until you know his love for you. And there's no way you're going to love your enemy if you think there are conditions on God's love for you. We don't always take these words serious because we think there's something we have to do. Because the whole world message is there's conditions. The, the, the world sends us a message that there are conditions on how we're loved. And God's saying, no, I loved you at your worst. Not your best, at your worst, I loved you, and I gave my son for you. And because we enter into that love, then that love begins, begins to transform us. And when we get attached to Jesus, who is love, then we become agents to love. People will say, well, you know, it's impossible to love your enemies. Humanly impossible, I agree but it's always him possible, right? Because he who is our life lives in us and allows us to love those that are unlovely. So let's read chapter 6, verse 12 through 15. It says, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherited the promises. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no greater no one greater by whom to swear. He swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. <coughs> Excuse me. Father, we pray that you would speak into our hearts. Lord, that we would seek your Holy Spirit's moving and transforming in our lives. Lord, that we would live out of that love and be continually grateful for the forgiveness that you have given us in Christ. And Lord, I pray that as we go through this passage that you would speak to our hearts and remind us of important truths. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. He says, so that you may not be sluggish, who had breakfast? I had biscuits, ham, scrambled eggs, and covered it all with healthy sausage gravy. In fact, my plate was so full there was no room for fruit on it. <coughs> I'm not going to let my body be poisoned by fruit and vegetables. Strictly beef, sometimes potatoes. Heart healthy. Anyways, I felt a little sluggish when all of those carbs began to digest. Spiritually, how do you become sluggish? Have you ever found yourself sluggish spiritually? Well, all you have to do is just get settled at where you're at. Just, just, just say, okay, I... I've reached the point that I want to reach, and I'm just going to slide on. Because what he told us earlier is that you've gone adrift. When you're, when you're, when you're adrift, you don't realize you're adrift. The, the word sluggish here could also be translated sloth. How many of you have ever seen a sloth? They're amazing creatures. You can spend 30 minutes watching a program on a sloth, and it has only gotten up halfway up the tree. <laughs> if you're a business owner, you know that a lot of people are sloths. 
They do as little as possible, slowly as possible, right? And he's saying to us spiritually, he goes, don't become sluggish in your hearts. And that become, we become sluggish as soon as the love of the world and the things of the world take priority or preeminence over our relationship with Christ. Because there can only be one that is preeminent in your life. And once we get distracted, then, then all of a sudden we become sluggish spiritually. And, you know, the, the, the pandemic, so-called, made a lot of Christians sluggish. Because they just said, you know, it's easier. I have an excuse. I can stay home. And then all of a sudden, what we had is spiritual disciplines start to fall off. Our prayer life starts to disintegrate. We're not communicating like we're in a personal relationship with the Lord. We're not affirming tr truth. And all of a sudden, our hearts get hardened, and we become sluggish. <coughs> we like to call him Lord and preeminent in our lives, but in reality, he's way down the list. And we have to ask ourselves, we have to confront these things or we'll never change. He said, I wish you wouldn't, couldn't you be a positive kind of preacher that only encourages us? I'm trying to encourage you by challenging your sloth, <laughs> by challenging your relationship, by, by encouraging you to realize who you are and who he's made you to be. If he's preeminent, if he's Lord, what does it mean? That he reigns over all of our lives. That we live at his direction and discretion. To me, the idea that God could take someone like me and put his own life in me is an amazing kind of thing. But I don't want to live every day without recognizing that it is him in me so that I can speak what he wants me to speak, do what he wants me to do, give how he wants me to give, and do it all with joy in his shalom. Because that's what he's given us. But he warns us at the same time, don't get sluggish. Remember that there is a discipline in our lives that helps to keep us healthy. If we ate biscuits and gravy every morning, we'd all be obese and diabetics. And we wouldn't have anyone to blame for it but ourselves. But, you know, once in a while, we can get Baptists. <laughs> right? I loved, I loved being a Baptist, man. We could eat whatever we want. And there was this thing called transubstantiation. <laughs> like Catholics. Baptists and Catholics have a lot of similarities. See, in Catholicism, when they take the host and the priest bless it, it actually becomes the literal body and blood of Jesus. Just by that. And Baptists, when they eat, they go like this. Lord, bless this food to the nourishment of our bodies. Now, I didn't dare pray that when I had that plate in front of me because there was nothing in that plate that was going to nourish my body unless there was transubstantiation. Like he somehow turned that into a salad with fruit on it. <clears throat> so he's saying to us, what makes us distinct? is that he actually is expressed as Lord of our lives, the one who rules and reigns, where we recognize all that I am is because of him. And all that I have belongs to him. So all that I am is because of his faithfulness. If we grow spiritually, we don't attribute it to our awesomeness. He does it despite our stubbornness. So don't be sluggish, but know you're to be distinct from the unbeliever by the way you live, by holding on to the truth. He says, they will know you are my disciples because of your love one unto another. Now here's the hard part. If you're an introvert and you don't like people very much, 
speaking of myself. I said, I used to like people, but then they messed it up. <laughs> if you're introverted by personality, you tend to withdraw and live separate. You can't love others without being in contact with them. Otherwise, what happens to you? you life is all about me. Life is about my schedule, what I want to do, because I want to do it. And that is evidence that we become sluggish spiritually. We are to be known for our good works. We need to be diligent and allow the Spirit to show us what our idols are in our lives. What is an idol? Anything that you bow down and serve. Like it's easy, you go to the, you go to the uh, Eastern world and you know the idols are very obvious. In America, it's less obvious, but it's very similar because it's the things that we worship, the things that we think we need to be whole. I think the smartest people in America invested in storage lockers. No, seriously, it, it, I wish I was smart enough to invest in storage lockers because it is the evidence of the American way that we will pay $300 a month to put stuff in that we're never going to use. And if five years later, we could have bought it all brand new anyways. So, what's an idol? Something that you think you need to be whole. Something you think you need to be secure. So, someone's retirement fund money in the bank, property, cars that we drive, all that stuff. And none of that thing is bad in and of itself. It doesn't matter what kind of car or truck you drive or house you live in. It doesn't matter. God blesses you. Thank God. Just don't let it become the object in which you serve so that you can remain diligent about the good works anything that is distracting us from our faithful obedience to what he desires to do through us. Every time I go to Sri Lanka and I come back, I'm always like, wow, I got it made. I mean, I'm, I sit there and I go, I'm looking at someone and I, I, need, I want to build them a house. And I can do this amazing thing to me. It's like blows my mind. I could build someone a house, a toilet, and a water pump for 10 grand. I couldn't go get permits in Bernie to build a barn for 10 grand. Do you see what I'm saying? It's like, I think my property taxes would, you know, just them would, would cover it. So I'm not, I'm not saying, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying you shouldn't have a nice car. You shouldn't have a nice home. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying don't worship those things. Don't bow down to them and don't serve them. They, you don't need anything more than Jesus to be whole. You don't need anything more than Jesus to be secure. Because, I mean, think, think about how everything we think that could make us whole and secure can be destroyed in a minute. He says, so don't let yourself be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. <coughs> Hebrews gives us examples of those who were men and women of faith. We have the patriarchs, the faithful saints who had gone before us. They look at them, he says. It's not about copying um, a methodology or a program or a certain kind of ministry, but we follow the example of faithful and patient services who inherited the promises of God. I've been going through in my devotionals, uh, 2 Samuel recently, talking about David. Think about this. David was patient in waiting for his promises. First anointed to be king probably when he was 13. 
wasn't even considered worthy to be one of the sons that were called before the prophet. I mean, that's got to hurt. <laughs> He's at 15 probably when he kills Goliath. He's 30 when he receives the promise to be king. Think about it. 17 years he waited for the promise of God to be fulfilled. And when he had the opportunities to make it happen himself, he refused. How many of us are, 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 are going to be that patient? He said, he, he could have killed Saul. And, and he was encouraged. All of his buddies are like, get him. You got him. God's put him in your hand. He's like, nope. Who am I to touch the Lord's anointed? Then you think of Abraham. Abraham has such a relationship with God <coughs> that amongst all of these idolatrous people, God had a relationship with him, spoke to him, and calls him to leave everything that he knew and was comfortable with. And he got up and left. Not sure how old he was. But then he, he, he goes with his wife and his nephew, and he goes, and year after year, he's been promised that he will have a son. Goes years and years, nothing. And the angel visits them, and he, she, and he says, next year you're going to have a child. And she's like, Sarah's like, <laughs> too late. And he has a son that next year, Isaac. But when he took things into his own hands, he had another son which is part of the problems that you read in the news every day. He had a son of the flesh who wasn't the son of promise. And so he comes and he receives this promise. Remember, what is faith? Hearing God, obeying God. But you have to see faith tied to the truth of the promise. God's promises, but he doesn't give us what he promises us on the day we want it. He gives us this fulfillment sometimes decades later. But he's faithful to all of his promises. So if we have a heart to know and obey the word of God, we're setting our hearts ready to respond, to be, to be participators in what he wants to do in the world. Well, you think about Abraham, ask yourself this, what are some of the things that are closest to your heart? What drives you? You know, I used to, I think about it, in, in the past, I had a very driven personality, you know, and in the financial world, I made good money, and most of it was just because I worked hard. When we were doing audits, you know, in L.A., not a fun place to be. Everyone would leave at 3 o'clock to beat the traffic. I stayed till 7 so I wouldn't have the traffic. And I got promoted. You know, they promote you because you're, you're, you're working. <clears throat> and I think I was driven by success. Even when I became a missionary, I, I was driven. Because I thought, man, the only way God will keep loving me is if I do a lot for him. Only to realize he loved me whether I did anything or not. He says, for when God made a promise to Abraham, he meant it. Ab I don't know how Abraham, I guess I get it a little bit, but you leave your family. When we left as missionaries, we sold everything we had, but we knew where we were going. If, 
and that was crazy enough for people. I mean, my dad thought we were insane. You're going where? You're doing what? You're leaving your career and you're going to go, couldn't make sense of it. But what about Abram's dad? You're Abram's dad and, and Abram comes to you and says, hey, God called me. Which God? Who? Yeah, he told me to get up and leave and go and he'll tell me where we're going later. Tell me which father in here would say, oh, that's a great plan, son. <laughs> no, if our kids did that to us, we'd be like, are you nuts? There's medications that help people like you. But Abraham obeyed. Even when he didn't know, he made some mistakes along the way. Like he was in Egypt, and he gave his wife over as his sister to cover his own butt. Don't do that, guys. It ain't going to end well. She must have been very forgiving. <laughs> but he, 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 he was continued in his journey, and he saw God prospering him along the way because they had a covenant with God. If you read through the story, you'll see that they, God made covenant with Abraham. And usually, when there was a covenant, there would be an agreement of terms, and then they would sacrifice an animal, and they would put the pieces of the sacrifice on, on two sides, and they would walk through the middle, and that sealed the covenant wasn't a contract that could be broken. It was a covenant. Well, what God did for Abraham was he brought the sacrifice, set apart, and he put Abraham asleep. And the fire passed through the pieces, which was what? God saying to Abraham, Abraham, my promises to you are not based on your faithfulness, but mine. I'm the author of the covenant. The same is true for you and I. This is the covenant we have with God. It wasn't our sacrifice. We didn't participate in it. He sent his son and he went to the cross to become the sealer of the covenant. He says, here's your part. I'll do it. Here's my part. I'll do it. This is the beauty of his faithfulness, that he's going to complete his covenant with us. We, don't, we think, well, what if I'm not faithful? He says, I'm faithful. It's my faithfulness that counts. You say, I don't believe that. It says in the scripture that he is faithful even when we are faithless because he cannot deny himself. Why? Because he's the author of the covenant. It's not you and I coming to God with an agreement and you say, okay, God, you did this for me and now this is what I'm going to do for you. And if I do this for you, then you'll do this for me. No. <coughs> he says, I did it all. Why is it Jesus plus nothing equals everything? Because even if our hearts were determined to be faithful, would we be any better off than Israel? Would we not be distracted by idols? I'm serious. We think, we look at Israel and their rebellions and we're like, gosh, those, those fools, they never did get it right. But I'm saying to us, listen, it's not about our faithfulness. You say, well, I would never bow down to an idol. You might buy a house you can't afford. You might look at your retirement and your investments and say, that's going to keep me secure. You might look at salaries and say, oh, I need more. I need this. You, you, you can bow down to all kinds of things. Why are we secure? Because he is faithful 
to all of his promises. And sometimes you wait years to receive it, but you patiently trust in his promises. You know, it's, I, I, one thing for me is with, is with my children, I'm, I hold on to this. My children and my grandchildren is like, Lord, you love them more than I do. And I keep waiting for them to finish establishing their testimony. <laughs> it's going to be a doozy. <laughs> but I trust his promises. If it's not this week or this year, then next year. Why do I trust him? Because he's faithful. I look back on the last 30, 40 years, and I have to stop because I get worried about the future. Like, I get worried about not so much my personal future, but I look things that I want to do missions-wise and ministry-wise. I think, oh, there won't be enough resources. Constant. Because every, every, every year the ministry expands. The, the, the open door that we've been given just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And I'm like, where are we going to get the resources? And then I have to stop and reflect and say, Lord, since 1988 when we went to Thailand, you've met our needs every single time. You've never been late in meeting our needs. I mean, it's been like last moment provision sometimes. <laughs> like, the day you need to pay, it comes. But he's always been faithful to his promises. And so as I look for my future, for my family's future, I have to be one like Abraham and trust that his promises are going to come true and not laugh when it seems impossible. Because he's the God who does things through the impossible. He says, and surely I will bless you and multiply you. Well, I forgot this part. He says, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself. So in tradition, Jewish tradition, they would say, I'll look to something higher than myself, and that'll be the basis of my commitment. And, and God's saying, well, there's no one higher than me, so I'll just swear by myself. And that's, the, that's what gives us the assurance it's not just an oath. He's saying that God is your guarantee. Do you realize that, that the Holy Spirit in you is the down payment that you will receive every promise? That Christ is in you to guarantee all of the promises. I love it because he changes Abram's name. He goes from being Abram to Abraham. Abram is an exalted father. Abraham is a father of many nations. Simple little change. And he became the father of many nations. Beyond numbers. But he said to him, I'll bless you and I will multiply you. God had a purpose for Abraham and for the whole world through Abraham. It was God's idea, God's purpose, God's plan. Now, what would happen if each of us changed this to this same model? Because I was trained, it's your plan. You, you make the plan, you work the plan, and the plan works for you. That's what I was taught. But what if I would let everything be different and say, God's idea, God's plan, God makes it happen. His idea, his purpose, his plan. Well, then I, I can instantly transform from being a world thinker to a kingdom thinker. And that's what the, that our purpose is. Because we all have plans. We all have ideas. 
We all have things we want to make happen. But if I can surrender and say, I can trust the faithful one. So, Lord, what's your plan? What, what do you have for me to participate with you in? Because that's all it is. I don't have to discover the will of God independent of God. He gives, I'll give you the idea, I'll give you the purpose, I'll give you the plan. He says, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. Think of all the temptations that he faced along the way. But he persevered in them, believing and expecting God to make good on his word. And then God makes good on his word and says, I want you to sacrifice Isaac. Think of the crazy things that God asks people to do. He says, take Isaac and sacrifice him up on the mountain. And Abraham said, yeah, okay, I can trust you. The Hebrews will tell us later that he trusted that God was able to raise him again from the dead. He trusted God that much. But he got there, and poor Isaac is like, Dad, we got the wood, we got the fire. What's the sacrifice? Abraham had told his servants, he goes, we go to worship. Worship for Abraham was to hear God, to bow down, and submit to his will. Now we know that as he went to be obedient, the Lord stopped him. He says, now I know you withhold nothing from me. It'd just be such an awesome place to be where we could live moment by no moment saying, you know what? There's nothing I withhold from you, Lord. Nothing. Because he says, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And there at the top of the mountain is the, the ram caught. Not accidentally, intentionally. God prepared it beforehand. God changed his name to align with his promises. And Abraham trusted the promises of God. I think there's some kind of credibility gap we have with God. If we can't trust him who loves us, who sent his son to pay the price we could not pay, and we still think we've got to do it and make it happen, there's a disconnect. Is God credible? Is he true to all of his promises? In fact, God is the only one who can be trusted without reservation. You know, I have a bent towards sarcasm. It's just a bent. Well, it might be more than that. It could be a real issue. Um, and it would seem to me like I just came to the place where I just had a hard time trusting people. Because I love to help people and serve people. And people are mean. Especially if you're a pastor. They think, oh, he gets paid for me to be mean to him. And people say horrible things to you. And they criticize you. And you're just like, man, can you just keep your mouth shut? Did you really have to say that? And so this person, I had, got mad at me about something and, you know, told me off. And, what, and I'm like, why do they hate me? I haven't done a thing for them. That's how it felt. See, people will let you down. People will betray you. But God will not betray you. So you can be at your lowest point and know that even if others failed me, God will never 
fail me. We have the assurance of the promise because we have the, the faithfulness of God. God will not deny himself. He's faithful even when we are not because he cannot deny himself. Try to remember, it's never about us. It's never about our performance. It's about the incredible working of God in and through us. Romans 4.11 says, He received the sign of circumcision and the seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believed without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. So he gets the promise. Circumcision comes in as a sign of being in a, a child of the covenant. But he had the promise beforehand. And Paul's laying down, he says, so it includes everyone. Everyone has a promise, whether circumcised or uncircumcised. Romans 4.16 says, that is why it it's depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring and not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, who is father of all. He says, there's a promise to the Jewish people, and there's a promise to all other people. Because we become children of Abraham by faith. What is faith? Remember, faith is my receptivity to God's activity. Faith isn't me wanting something and making it happen. Faith is hearing God and obeying God. Galatians 3.14 says, So that in Christ Jesus the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Okay, Gentiles. You have the promises. Hold on to them. Repeat them to yourself. Remind yourself that you have all the promises of God in Christ Jesus. And who's going to make it happen? God. You get to cooperate with what God's doing. Don't allow yourself to become sluggish in pursuit of the king and his kingdom. Whatever it takes, say, Lord, it's about you, your kingdom, not me. <coughs> I heard something yesterday about inheritance. And like, well, what am I going to get? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> um, listen, we have an inheritance in Christ. I told my kids, I said, listen. My plan is to die at the moment that I run out of money. So don't plan on anything. If I die of insulin overdose, you'll know that the money's getting low. My wife has been researching how to kill your husband and not get caught. I keep saying, I'm not a diabetic. I'm not a diabetic. <laughs> and then these boxes show up from Canada, and I'm like, oh, no. We are called to follow the example of those who have inherited the promises of God. So look back in the history and know that the God who was faithful to Abraham, the God who was faithful to Isaac, the, the God that was faithful to Jacob, the, the God that was faithful faithful to the apostles, the God that was faithful throughout your history, the people that you've known who walked with God, in your own experience as a believer, I'm not saying there haven't been tough times. There most certainly have to have been. But he's the same God of the promise. And when he makes a promise, you can be assured he'll deliver. What's our part? Simple surrender. Lord, what do you want to do? Lord, where do you want to go? 
Lord, how do you want to give through me? And when it is something that seems impossible, remember, it's impossible. Lord, thank you for giving us your word. And I pray that each one would walk away encouraged to seek what you desire, to trust your plan, and to know that you are always faithful to all of your promises. So we patiently wait to receive all that you have for us. Amen.